Good morning, afternoon, evening. Welcome to another edition of the Best DFS Show that just happens to start at 8 Eastern Standard Time. My name is Rob Diamond, Rad Rob Diamond on Twitter, Sir Robert Six on all the main sites. Welcome to Wednesday, December 12th, 2018 Champions League Breakdown brought to you by rotopros.com. I'm not going to waste any more time here today. I want to jump right into the slate. If you were playing DFS or Champions League yesterday, you were probably more than aware how much fun it was, all the goals that were scored. It was absolutely jam-packed. Today is not one of those days. We were looking at a completely different type of slate today with a completely different layout and unfortunately, completely different side takes where we're going to have to be quite reserved and extremely tight with our player pool because there are a numerous, uh, a number of games this slate that shouldn't pan out, shouldn't add up, shouldn't meet value, a whole bunch of should not. So uh, yeah, let's just jump right into the slate today. Uh, as always, I uh, will start here with the uh, schedule breakdown. So let's just jump right over here into this. And uh, yeah, as you can see, uh, Yesterday, obviously, the scores, uh, Dortmund ended up winning because, uh, winning the group, excuse me, because uh, of uh, the Atletico Club Bruges draw. Uh, obviously Spurs and Barcelona both got through because Inter Milan failed to get a win, which was the necessary result for them to progress. PSG, uh, destroyed, uh, Red Star in a very DFS, a very DFS friendly manner. Uh, the Liverpool Napoli game was ex incredibly close. So uh, really not a lot of DFS production, uh, while I was expecting more of a, uh, uh high scoring free flowing game. Mane missed like eight open nets. Uh, I'm not even going to get into the whole scenario of what happened. The score really should have been closer to 5-1, 5-2, 5-3 for Liverpool. Uh, but uh, despite all that, Liverpool got the points. They're progressing. And uh, yeah, th that was really the slate uh, from yesterday. Uh, so let's just jump right over into today's slate. Uh, obviously, the early games are the uh, the same group once more. Like I mentioned yesterday, if you didn't catch the video yesterday, uh, there's literally no surprises this Champions League. This Champions Champions League has ended uh, basically exactly the same way it was predicted. So um, a lot of the schedules for the final day are panning very true because of uh, the schedule that was built has actually followed through. So what we're seeing now is a final day of uh, an entire group. Just like yesterday, uh, today's Group G, that's uh, completely off the main slate. And while it's not as cut and dry as yesterday's off the slate, uh, group was this is still pretty irrelevant in terms of uh in terms of DFS, like in terms of, excuse me, sharp calls and creating a, or finding a situation where we can make a really sharp play uh, because Real Madrid and Roma should both walk away with the victories here. And the question will be between Pleasant and Moscow and all the different tiebreakers they will have to go through in order to uh, determine who gets to go to Europa and who's going home. Uh, so there is credence towards that, but that has very little relevance towards the grand scheme of things for this slate. So uh, we're just going to skip over Group G. We will start today is a E down, uh, E to H. Uh, obviously, E is a very interesting situation where we have both Byron and Ajax playing each other and Benfica and AEK playing each other. So uh, in many ways, this slate is determining the final position on the final day where if uh, Ajax defeat uh, Byron, they do need a win. If they defeat Byron, uh, they'll finish top of the group and Byron will finish second, where conversely at the bottom, uh, Benfica is already through to Euro. There's there's no questions here. And basically all that can happen right now is AEK uh, getting a, a little bit of uh, a little bit of a, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Uh, excuse me, last minute, uh, last minute of love uh, in terms of a victory or a point against Benfica. Fairly irrelevant, though. Uh, this will be the big important game right here, uh, Byron and Ajax. And while it may not have a ton of DFS relevance, we'll talk about that. Very important in terms of uh, the rest of the tournament and determining how the rest of the tournament pans out. Because if Ajax finished first and Byron finished second, that means Byron is going to be playing uh, a league, <clears throat> excuse me, a league, a group winner. And uh, by all definitions, that that is not what Byron nor a group winner wants to see. So uh, I'm sure a lot of the teams here, especially the group leaders that are already through, are looking for Ajax to finish second. Uh, but yeah, that'll be important to, to uh, determine at the end of the slate. And uh, for Group F, we have Man City uh, and uh, Hoffenheim. Uh, Hoffenheim coming to Manchester and Lyon making the big trip to Shakhtar. Uh, so this is actually an incredibly important group. Um, this actually, again, to say actually, uh, is probably going to be the group which you exclusively play this slate. Uh, 
I'm just going to flatline it for everyone. The rest of the games are absolute garbage. They're really bad. Like, Ajax and Byron are going to be missing a combined 11 players from injury alone. And that's even before we consider um, any kind of starting rotations they may throw out. Um, the Juventus and Man United, if, if you haven't been following my content for literally two years now... All I've ever talked about is that Juventus and Man United do not push score lines, they do not find true ceilings, and they never really meet their value in GPP to their salaries. They're always going to draw tons of ownerships because they're two extremely popular teams, and they're not completely lost of options. Like Their defenses are both incredibly viable, especially this slate, but there's no attack to shoot from, period. Especially on a side like Juventus, who have Ronaldo, Diablo, uh, Pjanic, uh, just to name a few, uh, Mandzukic, uh, Mandzucic, excuse me. Um, I'm, I'm not a noob towards him. I'm actually a massive fan. Sorry, my tongue just got tied there. The, uh, the, the implications for this final group are so small and so limited that it, it's really, you can so easily fade this game and not concern. Young boys are by far the worst goal scoring team of the tournament. Their, their conversion rates are borderline zero. Uh, Valencia is one of the worst teams in Spain right now. They're absolutely falling off the radar. So whenever we're considering will Man United and Juventus win, the issue with them is always that they don't go out looking to win games. They just make sure they don't lose. And again, if you've followed any of my stuff, I've been so, let's keep it uh, PG-13, um, not happy with Jose Mourinho and his tactics that he's always had of uh, not looking to win games, just ensuring they don't lose. And that's just, it's chicken shit. There, I said it. It's absolute chicken shit, and it's spineless, and it's gutless. Uh, there, I got all the words out I wanted to say. Like, that's literally the coaching style that he brings forward. And not only does that go against everything Man United's ever stood for, forever, like in, in their earliest of days, um, it's just something that isn't going to last in the English Premier League. And while it may work wonders 15 years ago when he was with Chelsea, or it may work wonders in Europe whenever they're playing Valencia and Young Boys two times each, um, or Juventus, another team that rarely scores more than two or three goals, these like blowout games are never going to occur in enough frequency to make you really say, wow, they are bad. But honest to God, everyone, look at every Man United scoreline, especially in the, even this Champions League. Look at how they've performed in the Champions League. The only reason they beat Young Boys, the scoreline they had, was because of Pogba's penalty shots. Like That was legitimately the only reason they got to that kind of uh, ceiling in a game. And it, it's incredibly frustrating for TFS because we know as players that the Ronaldo Diablos, the Pianics, the Rashfords, the Lukakus, uh, all these names should be performing and hitting ceilings at a consistent rate, especially against Valencia and Young Boys, and they're not, period. So uh, you can fade Group H especially in GPP. You're probably going to want to take some Juventus in cash, uh, but in terms of GP, GPP, completely avoid Group H. It's filled with ownership, it's filled with no ceilings, and it's filled with defenses. And if you want to attack defenses, that's a completely different story here, and you can absolutely chase a clean sheet chase with Man United or Juventus, but at the same time, just, just avoid these attacks. The only way, especially with this group so salted and so decided um, they're not going to go like if Juventus or Man United gets up to nothing by halftime that's it they're they're like there's no reason for them to score another goal not only in this game but if we look back in their entire history since Mourinho in particular has come into power with United they've never once looked to go past two goals even when they're losing so yeah they're, it's just not something to target here I'm sorry for um, I don't like Jose Mourinho, if you haven't figured that out yet. So uh, I think he goes against a lot of uh, what soccer is supposed to be about. So yeah, that that's my rant. I apologize. It is really relevant. I assure you, you can look at literally the entire history to see that I am being truthful and correct about this. Neither of these teams will... These teams will rarely meet their ceilings, Juventus and Man United, despite being massively talented, massively viable. Uh, it just doesn't happen. So yeah, that is my schedule breakdown. It's absolutely nothing like yesterday, like I was saying. Uh, and this is why you should only really be targeting Group F. Not only, uh, let me rewind here back to why you should target Group F. Um, look at the goals that they've scored this late. 
Only once, once before in Champions League history has a group scored more goals than Group F this season. Uh, and not only that, but they're absolutely within uh, striking distance of this record for this slate. I think they have 43. Three, if I remember correctly right now and um, the record is 51 so yeah it's uh I guess I could just do this 10 21 35 yeah there you go 42 so yeah I think that's 42 man my math's bad so yeah th there you go everyone the record's 51 if they score enough goals here this slate which is totally in par like um, when has Man City not been a four goal a game team unlike these two dickheads down here um when has leon not been an incredibly capable excuse me incredibly capable uh countering uh scoring side uh hoffenheim despite uh residing towards the bottom of the german bundesliga right now have scored in basically every goal this season including champions league uh, Shakhtar, you don't have to be a noob to understand that. It's really hard, one, to travel to Ukraine, and two, it's just really hard to play Shakhtar as is. So, like, this this group is really where you should be targeting today, especially when we're about to look at salaries here, and we see that Man City isn't the most expensive team. They're not the second most expensive team. They're not even the third most expensive team this slate, and they're going to score the most goals this slate. This should be so cut and paste for everyone. Just stack the city today. And much like yesterday, uh, don't get too caught up in the ownerships. Play the slate. Don't worry about what everyone's doing. Don't worry about salaries. Don't worry about production. Just play the schedule. Figure out who needs to win where and how and with what. And just play to that. More specifically, figure out who doesn't need what, who won't do what, and who won't be where. And you can easily draw that Juventus and Man United aren't the team to go after this slate in GPP, period. So yeah, there. That's my rant. Let's jump right into the slate. Lyon versus Shakhtar. So <clears throat> Lyon's making the trip from basically the farthest. I guess uh, this is my left hand, by the way. So I guess I'll do it over here since you're all watching. The farthest point away possible in France to literally the farthest point away possible on the other side of the continent... Uh, in Ukraine. Uh, this is even further away than the Moscow game. So yeah, this is basically the trips of trips that nobody wants to deal with. And if we're really being honest here, there isn't too much to look at in terms of the grand scheme of things. Um, neither is team, neither of, oh, get rid of, oh, ha, that gross game. Neither of these teams are overly skilled uh, in terms of like being able to dominate the other. Uh, in fact, what both of these teams tend to do is defend, sit back, let the other team overstretch themselves, and then they counter them uh, on the break. And since both teams technically can't do that this slate, one of these teams is going to be forced into doing what it technically doesn't do all the time. And it's probably going to be Lyon, which is a little bit concerning to me because... Uh, it, th this game is really frustrating to me, honestly, because it is a game that you. I know we have to target. I know there's something here. There's something will be here because we're playing the schedule, not the players and the teams. Um, I just don't know where. Uh, I I'm going to assume again. Hopefully, Rakisti gets back in the starting lineup here, and we can use him in cash. A 4.7k isn't the same kind of like click and walk away when he was 3.3k. Nice thinking, DraftKings. Good job. Um, obviously, this this pricing is way tighter. So uh, yeah, uh, I'm not going to sit here and tell everyone that Rictissi's the lock that he used to be, but he's absolutely viable in cash uh, from 4.7k. Um, like Fecker is the the player for Lyon. Like, there's no question. The issue is that he isn't really that fit of a player he's never been high in fitness and the second is that he hasn't been really healthy as of late so what's been happening a lot is the 84 and 74 and 79 games but more in particular to this while this doesn't show basically for his last 10-15 minutes of play he's like struggling to stay alive out there like forget play or be relevant on the field like he's just trying not to lose his life on the field because he's so out of shape and in so much pain and limping everywhere and falling over so like i want to say play fecker and i want to say yeah he's going to be fine and he's back to full health 
but it's just like all Champions League. He's been basically, I don't want to say a halftime player, but like after halftime, you get like 10 minutes from him and then he's toast. And an issue with that again is that Depay should be a massive guy again this slate, but these things that happen don't happen until Fecker leaves the field. Literally, Depay is invisible out there while Fecker's on the field. So, a lot of this has to do with the necessity of Fecker not starting and Depay playing 90 minutes. And then we can safely go on Depay uh, for 8.1k, which, man, City costs that much. There's no reason to pay 8.1k when you can get any of the Man City guys for the exact same price. Like, it, that's a really bad play. So, yeah, um, get in... I, again, like we're supposed to play this game, maybe in a GPP, uh, do a game stack. Uh, because like I said, there's going to be goals this game. Uh, TA is almost most likely going to score. Depay is probably going to score, but not till Fecker leaves the field. And Lyon will be dramatically reduced in terms of efficiency with Fecker on the field. Um, and it sucks because he's an awesome player and he's he should be like legitimately a world-class selection blindly throughout this entire champions league from the salary it's just for whatever reason he's just not healthy and he's and i, I think what really upsets me the most is that not only is he not healthy but leon refused to accept the fact that he isn't healthy and they're lukakuing him if you don't understand what i mean by that basically man united only played lukaku for two and a half seasons and what happened he he gets like incredibly unhealthy as like a physique as a person so um yeah this this is just something i can't stress enough Lyon is a team you're gonna have to play but they're goddamn frustrating to work with they're like disgusting i want to put my fist to the wall every time I think about how I have to figure this out because it's just so damn frustrating. Uh, Dembele <coughs> is totally in play. Uh, he's been scoring too, uh, so that helps. Uh, I'm not crazy about his minutes, but again, like this is who's supposed to be on the field for Fecker. And like this is all great and everything, but again, like it happens, and then he's gone because he managed to do it by just like barely surviving. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to say a two-two draw this game. Uh, now, if we jump back over to the schedule and we consider what a two-two draw does, uh, it doesn't help Lyon at all. Now, if we were to look at Lyon's Champions League. Um, they're the definition this this season of like the guys who, who basically dropped every ball possible. Like they've literally had of their five games, four of their last five games. So basically, after match week one, they could have sealed their promotion, and they've repeatedly dropped the ball. It would not surprise me today to see Shakhtar Donetsk actually win this game, jump ahead of Lyon and end up in the knockout rounds. It really wouldn't surprise me because Lyon have been playing that badly. So I am a little bit more on the Shakhtar side of things. Moraz and Tiazza are excellent plays. Um, Ismaili's one guy you're going to have to fade, unfortunately. His salary is just stupid. It's downright dumb. Um, last season, Ismaili took corners. Uh, and as you can see, uh, this season, that definitely hasn't been the case anymore. And what I think one of my big concerns here with Ismaili is that he's kind of like the Milicevic of Crystal Palace last season, who was like 6.5K and was good because he took set pieces and he took penalty shots. And then for five straight games, Milicevic got assists and goals that were completely separate of his actual role. And what ended up happening was... His price skyrocketed. People were convinced that he was still a good play because he was getting, when you look at his page and you look at his score lines, it's all right there. Goal, assist, goal, assist, da, da, da. Uh, But in truth, it really wasn't like that at all. And um, th that's basically his molly as well. Like, yes, he has a role. Yes, that role makes him viable. But he's been doing things outside of the role not doing his role at all and garnering so much production that his salary is being priced off of his production from his non-role work, which is like completely a part of the reason why people are taking him. I'm sorry if that's confusing. I'm struggling to like word that properly and get it out, but that's basically the Ismaili situation. Um, you can probably take him and things are going to happen because it's Ismaili and look what he's done this Champions League. 
but I assure you, I, I was I was one of the few people on his molly last season uh, when he was only like 3.4 and 3.6 and taking the left-hand side corner kicks for Shakhtar. And uh, obviously last year they had, uh, for anyone uh, who's interested, check out Sarna, S-R-N-A. Uh, he is technically, let, let's actually check it out together. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. Jarrah Sarna basically was the team captain, uh, legit, incredible, like world class, renowned player. Um, national team of Croatia, like helped lead the Croatian national team for years and years, and then mysteriously, um, basically was uh, tested positive for banned substances and. Uh, <laughs> surprise again surprisingly i say this because like this guy was not only a 90 minute player for every single season um he was their team captain exclusive set pieces every free kick every free corner every corner kick every penalty shot everything like sarna was the man and he rarely cost more than 5.5k um so yes yeah, sorry to talk about sarna here which is totally against the grain of um, what we were uh, discussing, which is this slate. Uh, but yeah, uh, in terms of, uh, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't play anymore. Uh, I, which is weird. Like he never really announced his retirement. He got suspended. He fought it and the suspension was upheld and they just kind of disappeared. And he still, like he was never like obviously anyone who's in North America and follows uh, what happens in the NFL, for example, Cream Hunt was literally cut within hours of his video coming out, and Shakhtar made no moves for well over a year of saying he's no longer a team captain, he's no longer on our roster, all sorts of things. So it's just a weird situation. Um, Shakhtar are incredible at home. Don't sleep on them. Uh, and if I was to give the score, uh, I would definitely say a, a 2-2 uh, Lyon Shakhtar draw. Um, but uh, Shakhtar is definitely the team uh, from these two that I'll be looking at, just because Lyon are so frustr frustrating, frustratingly contradicting. Let's say that. Next game on the slate, we have Hoffenheim traveling to Man City. Um, game of the slate, like it's by default the game of the slate. This game right here will be lucky to see three total goals. This game will be lucky to see two total goals. This game will be lucky to see two total goals. This game will be lucky to see three total goals. This game probably will see three more. This game will be very unlucky if it finishes under four total goals. Um, straightforward. Hoffenheim have played, I think, 24 games so far this season. All competitions, they've scored in 23 of them. They've scored in all the Champions League games. Um... I should mention too in the if you look at any keeper basically uh, from this group and they've consistently been letting in two goals like it's their job. Uh, so again, like yeah, you can definitely look for a defense here if you want, but like it's it's totally uh, the most GPP stretch of a, the imagination ever. Like this is the thing is that you can game stack or, or group stack this group. And ignore the defense, and the ownership is still going to be bare minimum because everyone's going to be on the Juventus Man United games. And all you have to do is just kind of exist outside of those games, and you already have a hand up. And then if you even further, instead of exist and really get yourself into this group and exclusively play this group, you're setting yourself up for a takedown. And that's even before we consider how the slate should play out, which would be. Yeah, you're, you're probably going to win some money. So, yeah, like I said, just check out the keepers. Look at how many goals they're letting in. There's no reason, I guess, Ederson, you could say, is uh, an exception to that. But even then, like, he's still letting in goals. Uh, four against Lyon, mind you. Uh, so, yeah, it's just not the, the group you want to target the clean sheet from this slate. But furthermore, you really want to get in this game basically anywhere you can. Um I would only look at Schultz at the back line. Um, I think Walker and Dolph are traps, if anything. Like, 
This is this is a 90 minute guy on Man City that's scoring an average of 2.6 fantasy points a game with clean sheets, and it's Kyle Walker, not just like some random nobody. Like for okay, okay, like I guess. If you don't want to cross the ball, you don't have to, but that's useless for DFS. So that even more drives home the point that there's nothing to look at on these defenses. Like, there's nothing to look at. Unless you want to lose your money, um, get in there, I guess. But this is really it. Like, Mares is averaging an assist this Champions League once every 75 minutes of play. Uh, Sané under 9K. I know... That the minutes haven't been perfect, but okay. Uh, Sterling, like for under 8.5k, like really. I'll just throw this out here right now. Raheem Sterling may be one of the best players in the world at the moment. If we consider the entire season so far, there's really not many names in the entire globe that chalk up to what Raheem Sterling's been doing in his domestic league and Champions League and everything. Uh, you can get. One of the best players, if not the best player in the world right now, on the best, one of, if not the best team in the world, definitely in England, um, and you're getting him for reduced ownership at 8.5k against one of Germany's worst teams that have let in multiple goals every Champions League and have let in goals in basically every domestic game this season. What am I missing? (laughs) <laughs> like there must be something here I don't understand. Uh, maybe it's minutes. Maybe there's some news reports that came out that I didn't read suggesting that all these guys are only exclusively playing 60 minutes, and the sites got wind of this. Like DraftKings got wind of it, and I didn't. I don't know what what to think here. But like, if you don't exclusively stack all the Man City attackers at least half of your GPPs this slate. I don't know what to tell you. I really don't. They they really, really should be your highest owned players this slate. And that's even before we consider uh, the other teams, before we consider the ownerships, considering the ownerships on the other teams that aren't going to score goals considering goal totals from all the other games that have ownership and not ownership like I don't know how to even stop talking about this like Man City are so obscenely the best plays and like De, De, uh, with De Bruyne and David Silva out this is only going to make more consistent 90 minute players from guys like this is just the best situation we could possibly hope for in terms of DFS uh and again like so many 90 minute players or let let me rephrase that so many players that would be coming on or coming off taking away 90 minute roles are missing the slate for man city making them they were already the play of the slate now they're just like dumb da dum dum the play of the slate like it's not even remotely close not even close so like don't worry about their ownership um i actually don't think it's going to be that high uh mostly because when you start clicking on Juventus names against a team like Young Boys, or you start clicking on Byron names, even though City or 8K-ish plays this slate, you still can't afford them when you get Lewandowski and Ronaldo or Diablo or and Diablo. Uh, so I don't think Diablo's going to start today, but that's just me. Um, chalk that City in, guys. Just grab it into this game. Uh, and, like, honestly... Game stack this. Group stack this. Like, I, I'll say it once more. If uh, you haven't, if you've been, like, actively ignoring my video so far despite watching it, uh, group stack this today. Don't worry about any other group. Don't worry about any other game. Just for GPPs, focus on this group and get as many players from this group uh, because this game should have four goals and this game should have six at least. Uh, that's a hyperbole, but this go- there should be 10 goals from this group today and I'll be really, really, really surprised if we get 10 combined goals from the entire slate. The rest of the entire slate, like 2 nothing tops, 2 nothing tops, like there's your max ceiling. Um maybe a 2-2 draw. Uh, so that's 2-4-6-8. And then I guess like Byron and Ajax could go out and do crazy things. But again, Byron doesn't need to win this. In fact, they can just specifically not let Ajax get a result and Byron are absolutely fine. So like, let's just jump into the next game now. Uh, I'm going to say uh, Man City 4-2 win over Hoffenheim. Next game. 
Byron and Ajax. Another really important game, both in terms of relevance and places you have to consider uh, because both of these teams, again, if we just go X, 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 how are we going to differentiate from that? Well, it's probably going to be this game. Uh, now, my big concern from this game is going to be ownership. I think a lot of people are going to instantly draw on Lewandowski because he's been scoring a lot this uh, UCL. And I think even more people, oh, eat crap, Robin. I'm sorry for saying that, but um, I don't like Robin. I've never really liked Robin. Uh as a player, maybe as a guy, he's a nice guy. He doesn't even seem like that nice of a guy. Um, so I don't really know. But in terms of uh, the most one-dimensional, boring player of all time, it's Aaron Robin. Like, if you, in 2018, 2019, are still letting Aaron Robin cut in and then get it onto his left foot and score a goal, hang up your cleats, homie. Stop playing. Like, legitimately, all you do is just force him onto his right foot. And he's going to do nothing like legitimately i don't think he's ever he's like 40 again my hyperbole age but um yeah uh he he's never really done anything with his wrong foot uh so yeah if uh that's just my robin rant sorry and with him and rodriguez both out this is gonna uh, uh if you didn't read my article yesterday uh jump over rotopros.com articles at the top there's lots of different, uh, they're all free, uh, but uh, under the soccer, you'll find mine. And I talked at length yesterday um, about uh, in terms of when a player or players end up missing and the replacements come in, are they value or are they dead money? Uh, because you can't always say for certain that a player is just going to come in and do well, but sometimes you can say for certain that they're going to do poorly because they just aren't very good players. Uh, or they're going up against really strong opposition. And in this case, the Byron guy should offer some decent value. Whoever does end up get starting ends up getting the start, especially with Robin out. Um, I wouldn't surprise me to see Coleman out. I know Dolberg's going to be out. Uh, so again, for uh, for Ajax, we may see a lot of ninety minute Huntelier. Um, so no. Um, even with Robin out, it really, it honestly wouldn't even surprise me to see Ribery not start today. Um, Byron are one of the teams that it's tough. Like Man City may just as well do random starters too. Uh, because, well, see the thing with Man City is that they can't lose. If they lose, Lyon beats them in tiebreakers if Lyon wins. So if, at halftime, Shakhtar are winning, and Man City go in and see this. They may just close up shot and a shop and not give a crap at what happens for the rest of the game because nothing needs to happen. They're automatically through, and they may take everyone off. Uh, they may end up not starting anyone, uh, which I think would be really random considering all their players are already hurt. So, uh, yeah, the uh, the Byron is in the same situation, like. I can't see Lewandowski not getting 90 minutes. Uh, so he may be someone you want to focus on this late. Mueller hasn't been good for a long time. Uh, now, he was once literally like the best player in Europe. This is his ceiling now. His ceiling isn't even worth a goal anymore. So um, while he still is one of the most experienced and valuable in terms of like uh, mental players in the in arguably in the world, maybe even uh, all of Europe. Um, it just isn't where you want to look this late. And furthermore, um, what's again frustrating is that Ronaldo Sanchez goes from taking all the set pieces to literally not starting to taking set pieces and penalty shots to playing five minutes to like so. I don't know if he like if he starts, it's it's even too much of a risk for me and. The question is, obviously, who's going to take the Byron set pieces? And it's probably going to be Kimmich. Uh, but, like, he hasn't done anything to warrant uh, to warrant those kind of salaries. Now, yes, yes, those are both against uh, fairly, I guess you could say it's Ajax again. Uh, but that was mostly corners. So I, I don't think he, I think he only had, like, two or three open crosses that game. And there was nobody on to take the corners. So that's where that came from. But, uh, like... This is where a lot of his salary comes from, which isn't well. I can't say that he scored for he got an assist last slate from a corner. So yeah, um, really expensive, really expensive, like too expensive. It just sucks because every slate he's 
the only defender, period, like remotely, not even close, uh, that is going to get double digit crosses. Like nobody even remotely in the same universe comes close to getting double digit crosses. Uh, so that's a reason to take Kimmich by himself. And it's probably one of the more lockier plays of the slate. Uh, it's just his salary is gross. Um, Guerrero did it for me last slate. Kimmich will probably do it for me this slate. So I have no issue locking him in. But in terms of Ajax, uh, they... Anona has been like an absolute amateur league goaltender. Uh, it It's blown my mind how badly he has performed and still not letting goals. Uh, especially the Benfica game was particularly embarrassing where he was making decisions that were like, wow, I can't believe you're actually doing this, man. Like jumping out, like going to punch the ball and not ever having a remote chance at ever punching the ball, completely missing it and giving Benfica a wide open net to score a goal. Like that, that shit is an amateur league. And you do not get away with that in the Champions League. You end up getting... Uh, knocked out of uh, the, the Champions League. And while Ajax have been incredibly fortunate this season, um, I think a lot of that has to do with how bad their group has been. They've probably been handed this one uh, because their group has been such a joke. Um, Benfica in particular, I'll get to them next, obviously. I just have nothing to look at here with Ajax, especially with uh, Zayak out. Uh, sure, they could score, but like Byron aren't a team to go out and allow floor accumulation so someone like Shone who could be really useful if Zayek is out in cash for only 5k still stands to not make a very good floor because Byron are just so good at shutting that down so um I think a lot of people will be drawn to Ajax this slate and I think it's a mistake I really do uh especially someone like Tadic who um Again, is like just like the Milicevic that we just talked about. He has this role, but then he does all these things outside of this role, and he does those things so well that it ends up, uh, what's the word, inflating his statistics and more importantly his salary to the point that like there's a reason not to take him now, and it's because of all the things he's supposed to do that doesn't. And once these things that he does that he shouldn't be doing stop happening, he's going to finish zero. He's not going to finish one. He's not going to finish four. He's going to finish with a goose egg. So uh, that's exactly like I was talking about earlier. Same situation. You can definitely roll with some Tadic and GPP if you feel frisky, but there's literally like... Yeah, he got an assist against Byron last time, and that's all good. But, like, uh, yeah, from 9.4K, 9. 9. are you serious, DraftKings? They are asking us to, play, to pay $1,000 more for Deuce and Tadic against Byron Munich. Deuce and Tadic against Byron Munich than Raheem Sterling against Hoffenheim, the team who has conceded in literally every game this season. This is no-brainer, guys. Like, I know I, I, I mentioned this at the start of the video. This slate is not very fun. Like, this is stuff that's, like, so obvious. But you're going to have to go against the grain a lot of time. Because a lot of people are going to be telling you, why aren't you playing Tadic? And you can confidently say, well, because he's 9.4K against Germany's best team. He's 9.4K against one of Europe's best team consistently every single year for modern history. Okay, so there's my rant. Don't play Deuce and Tadic in 9.4K. If you want to do it in GPP, okay, if you have to. Uh, but, like, legitimately, it's just... He's, he's going to finish with 11 fantasy points. That's what he's going to do. It's generally what he always does. And... Um, nine point whatever is not acceptable in cash for that kind of output. Uh, so yeah, it, a lot of this again determine is going to be determined how Byron lines up. If they actually come out looking like they want to win this game with their lineup, uh, I don't mind a three one Byron win, uh, two one Byron win. But in terms of if Byron come out here looking like a B side like Barcelona yesterday, you don't have to. Okay, they tied Spurs one one, so like you can get an idea of what happens when you come out with a B side. If that happens today, you can take Ajax. I'll say that. 
I'll get I'll extend the olive branch there. Uh, if Byron come out with a B side, you're going to be able to use some Ajax. You can probably get away with Tadic. But if Byron come out looking like they're actually going to do something today, don't even bother uh, with Ajax. Uh, look for a little bit of Byron. But but more importantly, fade Mueller and uh, fade Ribery. Uh, those are the two Byron guys you do not want. Could they do stuff? Absolutely. Sure, always. It's DFS soccer. But they're coming off at 70 minutes. So it's just not a big expectation. So, yeah, that's really my take for that game. I'm going to say 3-1, 2-1 Byron. Uh, Lewandowski with two goals, uh, one of them a penalty shot. Next game on the slate, we have AEK traveling from Greece to Portugal to play Benfica. Oh, this game is gross. This game is so gross. I don't even know how to begin discussing how gross this game really is. Um, again, another goaltender who's let in goals to every single team, including two goals to this Greek side who should be scoring nothing on nobody. Uh, so, no. Um, and Barkas, we can very quickly take a look once more. At least he's consistently kept it at 2-3, and three, which is nice. But a lot of that actually has more to do with A, the other team not being good enough to score more than three goals, or B, the other team not looking to score more than two goals because they are just like Juve and Man United sometimes, and they just decide not to try and win games. Um, so, yeah. In terms of this game, uh, it's gross. Uh, <laughs> Like, not only are they silly, silly overpriced, like, PZ should be 4K uh, considering what he's done this champion. So, you can, if you want to talk about a guy with, like, a role that's not doing anything and then not doing anything outside that role as well, uh, it's PZ. The only thing is that his salary has gone up nearly a full 1,000 this slate. No. How's that for an answer? No. Don't do that. Uh, he takes all their set pieces. He's their guy. And as you can see, he's basically done nothing with it uh, the entire time. Now, this is the only time against AEK that he's come even remotely close to a floor. And it took an assist. So, yeah. Just 6.8K. I'll say it now. DraftKings really frigged up the pricing this slate. There's some guys that are so stupidly overpriced. And my big concern is always from these slates is when these stupid overpriced guys still manage to do something and people are smashing the I was right button like idiots. So, yeah, um, I don't see any value from this game, period. Uh, there's not really a lot of ceilings. Like, Safravik plays... All the minutes you could want, obviously he hasn't really got them because he's bad and doesn't deserve them. Like, 12 points is what you get from a goal. Like, this is what he does. Like, this is his ceiling. Four points on top of whatever goal or assist production that he doesn't do that he gets. That's like his ceiling production. So, like, again, 6K for someone who's only going to score two times uh two times value with like their absolute best ceiling no not interested uh the one guy you can consider is jonas uh from benfica uh and that's because he's team captain and he has exclusive set pieces rights from corners to penalty shots to free kicks uh so he obviously you can see there but again like, it, it's really just not worth the risk. Uh, so, Benfica have, okay, like, two months ago, Benfica were one of the best teams. Like, uh, if you were to, like, standalone teams, Benfica were in incredible form, terrorizing the Portuguese domestic league, like, top of the, top of the peak, and they've done nothing but fall in the last two months. Like, dramatically fall. I think... They've uh, they haven't won in a really long time. They've fallen down to third in their domestic league, and that's saying something. I know Porto's a good team. Yesterday, Porto's now in the lead in the Portuguese league, but there's even like ghost teams that are pulling up on them and getting points on them. So like, there's just nothing to look at here. Uh, there's no ceilings. Like Jonas is coming off Sefervic. 
is you, you can even look at him. He plays in the Swiss national team, and they their fa- failures this World Cup largely had to do with the fact that Sefrovic was playing 90 minutes and scoring 4.5 every single game. Like, um, there's just no reason to look at that. Maybe Salvio, if he can get 90 minutes for a change, uh, but again, it's like there's so m- many reasons not to play this game. I hope I've gone over them. Skill, there's not a lot. Ceilings, there's none. Um, minutes, scarcely to be found. And especially in the important role players, there's no 90 minutes for either team. Um, the role play, the role players do nothing with their roles and nothing outside their roles, yet their salary is still increasing. Like, yeah, no thank you. I, I would even just say, I don't even care what the score is going to be in this game. Um, 0-0 for all I care. Like, give the goaltenders a clean sheet. They're still only finishing with 10 fantasy points because they're not making a save. Like, this is going to be the most boring game in the slate. Uh, and I'll be really surprised if either team scores more than a goal. Uh, now, let me rephrase all this and extend another olive branch. This game could very easily finish 3-2. The only way that's happening, though, is either you make incredibly stupid decisions in picking players who have no viability whatsoever, who happen to hit viability for the first time in their lives, or um, subs come on and do all sorts of crazy things. So there's just, like, things can happen. It's just there's nothing for DFS to, like, consistently and specifically target and say, like, this is where we're going to do and this is what we're going to do. So, yeah, Um, I'll say 1-1 draw. Uh, maybe a 2-1 uh, AEK because they've been the better teams of the two and they have better options of the two. Uh, but yeah, like find someone who's played consistent 90-minute games for the entire tournament and then maybe I'll talk. Maybe I'll have something positive to construct because until then, it's just what are you what are you really shooting for except other than negative EV scripts. So yeah, uh, two one eight ek. Let's give them the win. Next game on the slate. I'm actually going to talk about these two games together uh, again, just like I did at the beginning and in the last video. And if you aren't familiar with how successful the strategy is. Just go watch my video from yesterday and the final breakdown of the final two games. And that won a ton of people a lot of GPPs yesterday. Uh, both, uh, uh, excuse me, both on, uh, I shouldn't say both, uh, on all over my contacts. Whether it was on uh, the site, on Twitter, on the message boards that I frequent. People have been messaging me and saying that yesterday's video was spot on. And I'll tell you the secret right now. Again, I've mentioned it. Play the schedule. Don't play players, don't play ownerships, don't play salaries, don't play teams. Just play the schedule. Play what the schedule is lining up to happen and you'll make money every single time. And the schedule today is that this group is absolutely going to crap on everything and nothing else should really do very much. Now, is that what's going to happen? No, that's just what I see happening. Um, Now, in terms of the final game, we can consider... confidently say that consistently Juve and Man United will not look to score more than two goals while at the same time keeping the other team under a goal. That's the obvious scenario that you want here. Uh, So yes, defenses all day. Um, Both teams are expecting some heavy rotation. In particular, um, well, it it is also worth mentioning too, Man City uh, play Everton this weekend. And not only do they play, they are, they're at home, but they play Everton in the very early game. Now, obviously I'll be talking about this later this week in my EPL videos, but all the kickoffs are an hour early this week for English Premier League. And while that may not sound, and like when you hear it, it may not sound like a big deal, this is an incredibly big deal when you have teams coming back from Spain that just literally three days ago, before that Spanish game, played uh another english premier league game uh so yeah (laughs) play some defenses if you want but don't be surprised if we see some real serious squad rotation now something i haven't mentioned this season and actually i only discovered it a few hours ago and i've kind of been like i can't believe i didn't talk about this already this season is chesney the juventus goaltender if you haven't heard me talk about him before 
he's a glorified Wayne Hennessy on Crystal Palace. He just happens this season to be playing in on the world's best team and the world's best defense. Like legitimately, I don't know you at home. I don't know anything about you. I'm incredibly confident that you could play an entire season as a Juventus goaltender and you would get multiple wins. You could. It's literally that simple. Anyone can do it. Chesney is a bad goaltender. He's been bad his entire career. He was bad with Arsenal. He's been bad with Juventus. He's just been incredibly fortunate to play on arguably the world's best team and the undisputable world's best defense. Uh, So yeah, the big thing with Chesney when he plays teams that are real, this is what happens. Um, You'll notice, as I was saying, Juve are arguably, if not the undisputable best team in the world, so they rarely l- allow enough saves to offset any kind of goal that may happen. So let's say, let's say, Cesny still gets a clean sheet. His max score at the end of the slate is 14. That's his absolute ceiling. When you consider clean sheet win is 10, and then two saves is uh, four points. 14 is the ceiling. And whenever he costs 5.5K, uh, okay, like, I, I guess this slate, you can argue that 14 fantasy points from a goaltender is going to be extremely valuable when we consider all the crap show that is here and all the goals that are going to come from here. Um, you could ar- make the argument that it's viable, but, like, in most slates, in 9 out of 10 slates, 5.5K for 14 points from a goaltender is barely cash viable barely cash viable like you're just scraping by so i i don't really see a lot of reason to play chesney now what i wanted to talk about mateo mateo parents are bad goaltender this is like unbelievable to me that Matteo Perrin is not playing ahead of William Chesney. If you're unfamiliar with Matteo Perrin, he's the Italian national team goaltender. He's like legitimately a world-class player. And I know he doesn't look that much. I know he doesn't look the part. I swear on my life to you guys, this guy is such a legitimately talented goaltender. It's straight effed that Chesney is getting time. He was captain. Perrin was captain of uh, his Genoa side before being sold to Juventus. And he's only, like, barely, barely 26. 25-year-old was captain of one of the Italian's uh, best teams in Genoa uh, for multiple seasons. And he's not playing ahead of William Chesney. And he's the Italian national team goaltender. Like, come on, Juve, come on. Why are you doing this to us, fam? Like, my hope is, obviously, that Juve do their squad rotation as promised, and Chesney doesn't even play today. That would be a dream come true, that I actually get to play uh, Perrin in uh, Champions League this season. That would be a blast. Uh, But, yeah. Uh, Take, if you're going to go defense, I would definitely go Man United this slate. Uh, Despite the fact that Young boys have, like I mentioned earlier, they have the poorest conversion rates in the Champions League this season. It's not even close. Uh, like it, it, I think they don't even score in a third of the shots. So, um, or a third of a shot, excuse me. So, yeah, it's like they'll need six to eight shots on net before they could statistically confirm themselves a shot at a goal, a shot at a goal, like a chance for a goal. So yeah, like it's just not happening. Uh, so you could take Juventus, but like I'll, I'll very quickly glaze over Valencia by showing you what they did to Juventus. Like Valencia isn't a, 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 a like a, what's the word? Of, they're not going to bend over backwards and just give up. They're going to cross the ball, Tom. They're going to give a ton of production. And the question really will be is whether or not United can withstand that. Now, De Gea has been legitimately outstanding this Champions League. Now, I know his scores haven't really showed it, but against Juve, he pulled off enough saves to win him uh, the Golden Glove for the season. Like, legitimately kept Man United in both these games and helped them win. Uh, but, like, the question is, will United actually go out and do United things, which is bad? Or will they go out and act like a normal, real team with some talent for once and actually play to win a game? And... um. 
if they sit back and crap, Valencia could very easily take this game from them. And the concern is that they don't really care. Especially if they go in at halftime, see Juventus is up 2-3-0 uh, on Young Boys. They don't care. They'll take everyone off. They will legitimately sell themselves out for the loss. Because this group is completely solid. Uh, salted. Valencia is going through to the next round. Uh, Man United is going through to the next round. And their only hope is a repeat of last late where Atletico tied Club Rouge. Except this time, instead of Atletico, it's Juventus. Instead of Griezmann, it's Ronaldo. And instead of All Black, it's Buffon. Or excuse me. Oh, that would have been nice. Uh, it's Chesney. Uh, and United, uh, yeah, it's it's really tough. Like, just look at their scores. Like, oh, they got they got three uh, scored on there. Excuse me. Like, you know, two goals, two goals, two goals, one goal, one goal, two goals, no goals, two goals, one goal, two goals, no goal. Against Yeovil Town, two goals, two goals. Two goals, three goals. That was a, a random game at the end of last season. One goal, Newcastle again. No goals. That was embarrassing. Uh, no goals, two goals, two goals. One goal, one goal, one goal. Again, Crystal Palace. Like, you, you can't really compare the Crystal Palace, the Newcastle, and the Watford from the end of last season. Especially Watford, who basically completely changed their defensive fortunes around. Um, I'll, I'll just keep going back again. Burton, they score some goals. That was uh, that was a, another random outburst game. Two, Swansea City were like legitimately the worst team last year. So like the only time they hit four goals was against legitimately the worst teams in England. Uh, and Valencia is very, very, very far away from being the worst team in England. Are they doing very well right now? No. They're doing very poor in Spain. Uh, they're very injured. So that that's actually a, a really good point to bring up for the Man United-Valencia game is all the injuries in this game. Uh, there's tons of guys who won't be playing. Uh, so we don't really have to worry necessarily necess 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 necessarily oh that was bad sorry N necessarily um who's coming off for what or when especially up front for man united where if rashford starts we can almost guarantee him 90 minutes because there's nobody else to really take him off unless uh like if uh marshall may uh end up getting the starts uh it's tough uh I definitely like Man United over Juve. And that's saying a lot. That's saying a ton. A lot of that has to do with two different things. Firstly, uh, Juve very simply don't need to win. They can draw and they're fine. They can win one nothing and they're fine. Uh, you At least United has a little fire under their feet and they do need to win a little bit. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I think Juve is just going to be massively overowned. Uh, like I like Ronaldo and Cash, obviously, uh, but in GPP, like I don't know, the the ceiling just hasn't. Yes, can twenty fantasy points win this slate? Very easily. This slate, absolutely, no question. Twenty twenty fantasy points can do it. But like Diablo probably isn't starting, and if he does probably isn't playing 90 minutes and even more so uh probably coming off at a really bad time uh so yeah like obviously i have no problem with diablo he did score a hat trick but he's also been fairly flat since uh since then uh so there isn't really a ton to like shoot for and like i hope i've driven home the point now that this is the group that you should be focusing on for today if you haven't gotten the drift like the goals aren't just coming from the rest of these games and the defenses are too good in the rest of these games that uh they're just they're just no there's no edge there's no gpp upside uh now for cash yeah, absolute absolutely you know focus on the big names get in whoever you can i know Obviously, uh, Ronaldo and Lewandowski and Kimmich together is a pretty big ask. But, you know, diversify. Find the guys you need and want. Don't be afraid to look at the defenses on Man United and uh, Juventus, like especially 4.6K. I know Valencia is capable, but, like, yeah, I have absolutely no issue with that. Uh, like I said, just, like, stick to these uh, stick to these games. Um. 
and you're probably going to be fine. You can literally build like you can go Sané uh, or uh, Mares, who I, I did mention. I know I mentioned is uh, assisting once every 75 minutes. Like Karamic has been incredible, I mean, arguably the best DFS player uh, this Champions League uh, when you consider his salary and output and consistency. Uh, I don't even mind him in cash against Man City, who are probably going to concede. Uh, now, obviously, this doesn't leave you a ton of money left uh, for your midfields. Uh, but, like, this is just something I'm just, like, shooting the shit right now with you guys. Just trying to give you an idea of where my mind's at. Uh, you don't even need Ronaldo in, uh, in cash because, uh, yes, his floor is great. But he has literally no ceiling. And there should be tons of ceiling to be found everywhere from still decent floor plays like Mares. Uh, so yeah, um, final two games, I'll say two nothing Juventus and I do like Paul Pogba this slate. I like Paul Pogba. I'm going to say that before I close this out, I really do like Paul Pogba this slate and that is concerning to me. I think this right here is a really neat, uh, cash GPP kind of variance, uh, mixed stack. Um, Let's say 2 nothing Juventus and 1 nothing Man United. Maybe 2 nothing Man United. Maybe even a 1-1 draw here. That wouldn't surprise me either. Uh, Valencia finds a goal. Uh, I have to give DraftKings credence when they're pricing De Gea down so low. They usually know what they're doing. So uh, I'm not going to uh, debate it too much today. They usually know what's coming. But uh, I do like the idea of DeGay from the salary. Uh, so I will say one nothing Man United, 2 nothing Juve. And that, my friends, is the Champions League slate for Wednesday, December 12th, 2018. Thank you very much for tuning in. As always, I am Rob Diamond, Rad Rob Diamond on Twitter, Sir Robert Six and all the main sites, rotopros.com. Get over and check us out. Uh, give a look at all the different content we have, especially check out our, our NBA, which has been particularly flames. Uh, Josh has been absolutely killing it all season. Get over here, sign up, uh, get involved, uh, and uh, get in contact with me. Let me know you're watching. Like, subscribe, comment, whatever you got to do. Hit me up on Twitter. Uh, my ego is always desperate for, more, uh, so for some more love. So thanks a lot, everyone. Take care. Much love, and always... As always, hopefully see you at the top. Later.